okay so uh, we have just understood the deity of jesus and the humanity yeah uh, hebrews chapter 3 is the main theme here is that the lord jesus is more superior to moses one of the reasons why the author would choose to talk about this is because he wants the people to heed the word of god um, through the lord jesus because the lord jesus himself is logos so he wants the believers to fix their eyes on Jesus. Jesus being uh, superior to the angels, Jesus being the uh, right representative, uh, having put on humanity, and now superior to Moses. The Jewish believers held Moses with great respect. He was one of their greatest prophets. And now the writer is telling them that Jesus is even greater than Moses. Why would you not uh, honor him? Why would you not worship him? Why would you not listen to what he has to say? And so, again, this passage, now we also know that um, originally when scriptures were put together, there was no real numbering there but the numbering has been done for our convenience so it's in continuation so he just talked about um, you know deity humanity of jesus again there's a word called therefore therefore is a, a connecting word now that i've talked about all these things i'm going to tell you something more there's a connection therefore he says holy brethren he uh just shared with the believers that Jesus is the brother. Uh, and so now what are the believers being called? Brethren, holy brethren, because they have also received salvation through the works of Jesus. Okay, so holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Wow, what favor, isn't it? Uh, that the believers are being told that their position now has completely changed now maybe in the earthly realm they are going through difficulties and uh, the kind of persecution that they were facing at the time uh, they might have lost respect from the people of their own community now if jews put their trust in the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, they would have had to forego several rights, you know, um, maybe even the right to uh, land, the right to you know certain provisions. People would not have respected them. While they're going through such crisis, the author is reminding them, think about your spiritual identity. Earthly identity, yes. You are going through some struggles, but who are you? Holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. So wake up to the great spiritual reality of what you have in Christ Jesus. Earlier, as partakers of the heavenly calling, we know that the writer also said, sons of glory because Jesus died to bring many sons to glory. So these believers were also those who were blessed by the Lord Jesus in all these ways. So basically he's bringing encouragement, you know? encouragement after encouragement, fix your eyes on Jesus, know who you are, know your identity. And he says, in going through whatever you are, facing today consider consider the apostle and high priest of our confession christ jesus you know a uh, beautiful thing is that in difficulties we can fix our eyes on the problems 
we can fix our eyes on the loss we can fix our eyes on many things around us but you notice the writer of the hebrews all that the believers are going through he knows that if they neglect so great a salvation you know they might drift away so he's telling them again and again now we see jesus look at jesus now he is he is all this to us and then again he says consider consider no consider over there the greek word which is used is katanoian okay k a t a n o e i n uh, consider is to very carefully examine and look deeply into when you want to buy let's say a laptop you don't just see a name oh i i see some name hp something i'll just buy it it's okay we don't do that we very carefully consider isn't it we see okay i need these features what is the battery life what is this what is that you examine you consider deeply and then you go ahead and make a purchase because it's very very important so in the same way he says when you think about the lord jesus think deeply give your full attention don't just have christ as a passing thought no consider whatever i've told you so far please remember that and in addition to it consider he calls the lord jesus you see more functions that explain the person of christ to us he says apostle who is an apostle apostle is a is an ambassador okay a representative so jesus is the representative of father god so he is an apostle and high priest we are told that he is also the high priest high priest of our confession so that also tells us that you no know, he is the one who stands before the the uh, father for us and uh, he represents us and he is the high priest of our confession you know our, our confession is the confession of our faith okay so he is holding on to that um, and uh, these are the functions he becomes our um, he becomes the ambassador of the kingdom of god and he's also the high priest who uh, in in a, in a way you know he um, watches over our confession and what should our confession be our confession should be a confession of faith now in the case of what these believers were going through uh, the writer wanted their confession to be a godly confession instead of saying oh we are struggling where is god what is this none of that instead you know, a confession of faith which says you know we know god is for us we know that the lord jesus has become our uh, redeemer he has bought salvation you see confessing the word of god confessing the truth of god's word not just the natural facts but the confession of faith and the lord jesus he is the apostle and the high priest of our confession what confession verbal confession and you could also you know uh, consider a confession in a way the the life that we live in alignment to uh, god and salvation so he is watching over our lives and you know he uh, is watching over our confession and we better make a confession of faith we are also told that the lord jesus was faithful to him who appointed him who appointed him god the father appointed him did he complete what he needed to complete yes did he complain about it no but he fulfilled everything that he was called to do and similar to what kind of responsibility did jesus fulfill very similar to moses now moses was also faithful in all of god's house how was moses uh, moses faithful 
he too completed what God called him to do. However, here is the comparison. Now he says, both are faithful. Jesus was faithful. Moses was faithful. But Jesus is one counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Why? Because Moses was just an earthly leader. What about Jesus? Jesus is God. Jesus is the son of God. You know, he is both God and man. So while you respect Moses and you respect the law of Moses, you need to give greater honor and worship to the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the Messiah. Continuing from verse 3. So he says here, look, when you look at a house, um, you we praise the house. But honor is given to the one who built the house. So in the same way, you know, we honor Moses because he was a faithful servant in God's house. But how much more should we honor the Lord Jesus Christ? Because he is the heir. He is the son over the house of God. So you see that you know, uh, the, uh, Moses is but a human being. So he's just bringing a correct understanding to the Jewish believer. And uh, you know he says that because Jesus is greater, uh, I want you to stand firm. You know, and also over here he adds this and he says, whose house we are. Okay, whose house we are. So that's a manner of speech that shows us that we are God's family. Isn't that wonderful? Now again, earlier we saw Jesus saying that uh, you, he does, he's not ashamed to be called our brother. So we are brothers and sisters of Jesus. Now we are told whose house we are. We are called as his family. We are holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Wow, what a wonderful um, uh, privilege. What a great position we have as God's people. And then he also encourages and he says, look, if you give up on your faith, then you, know, you will not so much be a house of God. But he says, we are his house if we hold fast the confidence. So basically, he's saying, don't give up. Hold on to your faith. And he says, rejoicing of the hope, firm to the end. Now, when we do that, you know, when we are people who are steadfast and firm and established in who God is, who we are, isn't it? Like if you look at three chapters here, um, if you pull out, okay, what are the main themes that are talked about here? You would find God's identity. Who is God? And then man's identity or a believer's identity. Who is a believer? Who am I in Christ Jesus? And then you, know, you find encouragement. Keep focusing on these things and be strong. You know, hold fast the confidence. Rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. And he continues okay, uh, uh, and, and says that one needs to apply their faith. One needs to apply their obedience you know, uh, in their relationship with God. So he goes back and uh, refers to the generation that Moses led. So I'm in verse 7. I'm going to read from there. He says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, you see, Trinity. Remember, there is a mention. So... Godhead, their interaction, the person, son of God, we understood, the father, father appointed the son. You see, there's so much about each person of the Godhead that we can pick up. And now it says, the Holy Spirit says. So, Holy Spirit communicates. Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity. Okay, we are gaining that understanding. So where is revelation coming from? You know, if you go back uh, to certain passages in the Bible, you study that the spirit of God is the spirit of revelation, spirit of understanding. So no wonder 
he is bringing in understanding from a certain passage of scripture holy spirit says today if you will hear his voice do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me tried me and saw my works 40 years therefore i was angry with that generation and said they always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways so i swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest so in the kind of uh, life that the people led by moses you know uh, had you notice that there was an issue with their heart you know they went astray they always go astray in their heart so where do our responses our reactions our motives uh, arise in our heart and as long as our heart is filled with faith we are okay but when we go astray in our heart you know uh, it always works like this isn't it it begins with uh, our thoughts and then our be our actions are affected our behavior is affected our you know lifestyle is affected but where is the beginning of this progression from our hearts so in the same way you look at the generation that moses led now this is the generation that did not make it into the promised land did god want promised land for them yes how far was the promised land if you look at the maps you will realize that something like 11 days just 11 days away promised land was there moses took these people out of egypt in 11 days they should have reached but 40 years they were going round and round and round in the wilderness why their hearts did not have faith you see here hard do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion so what kind of hearts did they have hearts that went astray hearts that were hardened what is a hardened heart a hardened heart is a uh, a heart that doesn't have a sensitive response to what god says you know we uh, know about the work of the holy spirit he convicts us of righteousness sin uh yeah sin righteousness and judgment so as soon as we have a sense oh what i did was wrong when we respond to god oh god you know you're convicting me holy spirit you're convicting me okay i won't do that or i will repent before you or i will ask for forgiveness or i will make it right if we don't do that over time what happens our heart doesn't respond anymore now we can keep doing the mistake again and again and again and not feel anything because our heart has become hard so these people when they strain their hearts they had hardened hearts as in the rebellion rebellion is what to say we don't want your ways whatever we think is good for us we want that so you know god brought them out of slavery from egypt but here they were complaining about you know some leeks and some i don't even know what things are garlic and you know all that is not there meat is not there moses why did you bring us to the wilderness did you want to kill us a very rebellious attitude right they were so self absorbed they just wanted what they wanted they did not yield to what god was doing in their midst now if they had yielded if they had the right kind of response reaction to god what could we have expected 11 days go from egypt to canaan finished 40 years they are in the wilderness okay and what else to be read here one second thank you um fathers tested me tried me 
Okay, so that is God's experience with these people. They were unbelieving. A testing God. God, give us a sign. Prove this. Prove that. So, basically, it all boils down to unbelief. And we are told they saw my works forty years. What kind of works did they see? Now they saw water come from a rock. They saw manna. They saw quail. Now they saw the Red Sea parting. The more you know, you when we see God's work, what should happen to our hearts? It should become softer because we understand. Oh, what a good God! It should become softer. But how sad! These people had a hardened heart. No matter what God did for them, they saw so many miracles. You know, pillar of uh, fire, cloud, amazing things. After seeing so much, they are still rebellious. They tested your fathers, tested me, tried me. Okay, so what happened? God says, "I was angry with that generation." So we know ultimately what what God decided. This generation will not go into the promised land. Do you recall there was only the uh, younger generation led by Caleb, Joshua. They were the ones who went into the promised land. Why? You know, unbelief cannot inherit the promises of God. Okay, so that is the reason, and so. the writer here is pointing out to the believers and saying never lose your faith now faith is very important hold on to the confession because jesus he is the apostle and the high priest of our confession and continue to have faith don't be like the people whom moses led i got so angry with them that i decided that they shall not enter my rest what is the rest of god the fulfilled promise the fulfillment of god's promise canaan okay canaan is the representation of the fulfillment of god's promise people of this generation did not receive the promise what is the reason answer unbelief unbelief so unbelief can keep us away and the urgency which the writer adds to it he says today if you hear god's voice he says learn to respond quickly today you know today it's it's like saying right now if you hear god's voice respond don't say i will make a decision tomorrow i will accept christ tomorrow don't put it off whenever god speaks be sensitive you know that's the bottom line okay moving ahead again he says beware Brethren, verse twelve: Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. So, what is the description he gives to a heart of unbelief? He says, "Evil, you know, a heart that doesn't trust God, is an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God." And what does unbelief cause us to do? We've seen earlier. no again it's like a warning he's packed in a warning in these passages and he's saying don't neglect lest you drift away give the most earnest heed consider and he says evil heart of unbelief departing from the lord it will cause us to do what when we keep unbelief uh, we think nothing will happen but evil heart of unbelief the in departing from the living god okay living god is um, you know he he is with us he is so real and yet we are not able to trust him you know that's such a tragedy uh, but then he says instead of that going away from god exhort one another daily while it is called today so there is the value of the persecuted believers right similarly you could we apply it today for ourselves we should not have a heart of unbelief it's dangerous to have a heart of unbelief and at the same time you know there is value in believers encouraging one another how often should you encourage one another it says one exhort one another 
daily so each one of us we may think that i am not a preacher i am not a teacher of god's word i don't know so many things but we can encourage them in what in faith if our encouragement helps somebody to have stronger faith in god you could speak scripture you could share about the lord jesus and his work of salvation and what did we learn earlier hebrews 2 4 whenever we speak god's word god follows it up with signs wonders miracles so you just be faithful to encourage people with the truth of god's word how often daily whenever we get an opportunity somebody is discouraged somebody is going through some situation as a believer i can encourage them okay regularly i can encourage different people around me my family members my church people regularly i can encourage them to keep their faith in god why because when we do that as a community we are told here that you no know, less their hearts be hardened if we don't do that what happens you know it's an opportunity which god has given us if we don't do that we're also uh, foregoing that opportunity and what is the danger hearts can be hardened through deceitfulness of sin you know there's so much depth in that hardened okay so hardened heart is an unresponsive uh, a heart that lacks sensitivity towards god through the deceitfulness of sin what is the quality of sin sin lies to us if you recall going back to the garden what did uh, the serpent tell eve if you eat this fruit you will become like god is that true partly you no know, some knowledge she received of good and evil but did she become like god actually no death came in sin came in death came in how is god god has eternal life but what happened to mankind no death came in and so the serpent deceived eve that is the quality of sin even today satan promises many things oh if you engage in pleasure no problem nothing will happen nobody will know but scriptures tell us deceitfulness of sin it will lead us to destruction that part he won't tell us and that is why in we will see in hebrews there is another passage where entangled it says entangled in sin you know it's like this uh, spider web have you seen some small insects without their knowledge if they just enter that web what happens they just get all entangled they don't know how to come out of it okay so sin has that quality of deceiving us and uh cap- capturing us and so this is a warning we are told unbelief you know and a hard heart uh, the deceitfulness of sin stay away from it and one of the responsibilities he gives us to all the believers in the community and he says you know that in the journey with god now sometimes people go through discouragement so as a believer why can't you encourage another believer with whatever possible you encourage them okay so that everyone uh, fervently follows christ and hold on to their faith again he says for we have become partakers of christ earlier what did he say partakers of the heavenly calling that is our identity now he says we have become how did we become by putting our faith in jesus partakers of christ if we hold on the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end while it is said today if you will hear his voice do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion again he's just saying we need faith we have to hold on to faith don't become hard of heart and you know in the christian journey when we study the book of hebrews it's also an encouragement for us um helps us recognize that beginning is great okay 
the beginning of our faith journey is wonderful and a lot of times that's what we talk about you know so and so accepted christ wow it's great yeah even heaven rejoices when somebody accepts christ but when we journey along there is an element of perseverance required it's not easy okay we have to make the journey till the end so what is more glorious beginning is glorious no doubt the end should be more glorious and that's what god wants for the believers and that's what here you know the believers are being encouraged and said hold on you know keep that confidence till the end till the end come on believer you have to journey till the end and that is also you know one of the themes of the book of hebrews till the end make it to the finish line okay that is very important now going to verse 16 here again he is referring to those rebellious generation he says what happened to them they heard having heard rebelled so is it that god is not speaking no god is speaking we are not responding in the right way to god so that is the issue so that was the problem with the uh, that generation one is they didn't have faith now you notice that they did not even have obedience that was the second issue here one was faith there was a faith issue there's the obedience issue so he says uh, continuing from verse 16 for who having heard rebelled indeed was it not all who came out of egypt led by moses now with whom was he angry 40 years was it not with those who sinned whose corpses fell in the wilderness and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest but to those who did not obey so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief okay so there is the element of unbelief which kept them away from what you know the highest and best that god wanted for that generation what was it canaan the promised land the land running with milk and honey god wanted that for them but they never got it hardened heart deceitfulness of sin okay unbelief and also we've just seen disobedience god was speaking to them but they never responded they did their own thing so these are all warnings for us you know as believers today we have to be careful about unbelief and disobedience now let's move on to hebrews chapter 4 this passage it is in continuation to what we have been reading now about this generation and the reason why they did not receive the promised land again you know he adds that connecting term there therefore now you've understood what unbelief can do so therefore since a promise remains of entering his rest now he's trying to shift the focus to the reality that the land of canaan is not the final rest okay if it was the final rest then the people already got rest what else is left nothing but he says no it's not over yet all of us as believers can experience the promised land in a in a, in the sense that they are the promises of god we can experience the promises of god uh, if we continue with faith and obedience so that's what he's saying so now it's coming to the believer it's not so much about the rebellious generation so he says since a promise remains of entering his rest let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it meaning he says please don't miss it it's available so don't miss it for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them but the word which they heard did not profit them not being mixed with faith in those who heard it so he's saying you know what is that key ingredient 
which these people missed out, the rebellious generation? Did they hear God's voice? Yes. Did they hear God's commands? Yes. But here's the problem. They did not mix it with that active ingredient called faith. They missed the faith. So they heard the word, but they did not mix it with faith. So he's telling the believers of today, if you hear God's voice, if you hear God's word, mix it with faith. Then you can uh, see God's promise unfolding. Okay, This is like saying uh, this term mix, uh, they have... Um, looked it up in the Hebrew and you know the, basically it comes from uh, the application where whenever we eat food uh, it gets mixed with our saliva it also gets mixed with our digestive juices okay if that doesn't happen the food will not be digested you see so in a similar way when we hear God's word you know, there are so many people who hear God's word. But when we hear the word uh, as, you know, there's no faith. Yeah, okay, whatever, you know, this is what the Bible says. Okay, fine. No, when we hear God's word like that, uh, without reverence, without faith, it doesn't work for us. So he's telling the believers, come on. Have faith in God. Whatever he has told you, will he not do it? Just because you're going through some difficulties, why do you let go of God's word? You know, you mix it with faith. When you mix it with faith, what happens? That word gets digested and it produces for us. You, know, you recall when we studied um, about the Barians uh, in the book of Acts, they were a fair-minded people and uh, the word which they heard, they never took it lightly. They went back, they examined the scriptures because they wanted to put their faith in it. So God's word should never be studied like a historical record or, you know, uh, uh, some geographical information or, you know, knowledge. I'm gaining knowledge out of reading the Bible. All of that is there. It very much is you know, one of the greatest literary works. But you see, there can be so many historians and, um, you know, uh, scholars who have read the Bible and yet never received salvation. Why? Because they never mixed faith. So what is the active ingredient which will cause the word to be digested and produce fruit in our lives? promise to be fulfilled in our lives faith okay so faith makes it work so he's inviting the believer and he's saying keep your faith come on if you have your faith hold on to your faith now you will see uh, god bringing you out so he continues he says uh, for we who have believed do enter that rest because god wants to provide his rest. Rest, in other words, is fulfilled promises. Okay. God's fulfilled promises. Uh, so, you know, he says, uh, so they shall, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. This is the rebellious generation. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So how does God finish the works in the beginning? Right. How does God finish the works in the beginning? So one way of understanding this is, in his mind, you know, God saw everything unfold in his mind. It was done over. So once it was done in his mind, that's when, you know, he, he uh, started like working on the world. He again kind of created, he said, let there be light. But before that, in the beginning itself, it was over because in his mind, it was done. The plan was done in his mind. So the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So that is very hard for us to understand. How can you finish in the beginning? But in God's mind, everything was done. Okay, Jesus had come, 
Jesus has redeemed, everything is over in his mind. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. So we are told that in creation, okay, we, we all know that on the seventh day, did God need rest? Personally, I don't think so, because we know that he never he slumbers, he never gets weary, he doesn't require you know, that kind of a rest. But when you see God follow something, there is value in it. Okay, Even if we don't understand fully, why did God rest? We may not you know, know all the answers, but on the seventh day, he rested. That means there is something called, and then he says, uh, they shall not enter my rest. So there is a kind of rest that God experienced. And he says, my rest. So a God kind of rest is available, which God himself experienced. And God is saying, I want to give it to you. But how can we experience that kind of rest? God kind of rest through faith and through obedience. Okay, So those are the answers. So there is a rest. There remains a rest that we must enter. The uh, writer says to the, uh, the, uh, the perplexed, the demotivated, the discouraged believers. He says, believer, don't worry. You can have the God kind of rest even in this situation. There is a rest that you must enter. Okay. Uh, and uh, so I want you to respond to it. You know, if there was no such rest, then we would not talk about it. Because uh, if Joshua had given rest, okay, in this passage, he says, uh, the people were led to the promised land. And that is the end of the story. So there is no more rest. But you know, there is a rest. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. So when we walk by faith, uh, you know, it's amazing that we can experience a calm, we can experience a joy, a peace, which is beyond our understanding. It's the God kind of rest that God alone gives us. But how can I receive this rest? Faith, obedience, not like the rebellious generation. They, God did so many wonders, still they did not believe. But when we have that simple faith that responds immediately, it says today, if you hear God's voice, meaning the sensitivity, urgency, immediately you respond. Oh, God, you're saying, okay, I believe, I believe. You know, when we walk with faith with God, we are told that we can experience God, the God kind of rest. Okay, it's an amazing rest that only, uh, it's a spiritual rest that we can experience. Then we are also told, verse 10, for he who has entered his rest, meaning you see here again, it's, it's kind of strange. It is rest, but we have to enter the rest, meaning it's going to take an effort from our side to get into this rest. Whose rest? His rest, God's rest, God kind of rest. So can all believers have it? It's available for all believers, but we have to take the initiative to enter it. Okay, so who has entered his rest himself, it says also seized from his works as God did from his. So we are told, you see on the seventh day, God you don't find that he created anything. Seven day, he just rested. So there was no work, no performance on the part of God. So what is the parallel? The parallel is when we experience salvation or when we experience the promises of God, there is one kind of work which we are doing. What is that word? We are applying our faith. That's the only thing that God is looking for, not to make it happen with our performance. Okay, But we accept the work which Christ has done. You see, so the righteousness that we walk in today is 
through the work which Christ has done. But what is the so-called work that we are doing? Faith in what Jesus has done. Okay, So that is what is required of us. That's all. To have faith in what Jesus has done. So we are resting in that sense. We are seizing from our works in that sense by putting our trust in the work which the Lord Jesus has done for us. So the writer, he invites us in verse 11. He says, be diligent. You know, diligent is when somebody is um, uh, sincerely engaging in work. You are a diligent student, meaning somebody who's working hard and studying and, you know, keeping up with the requirements of their study, that person is diligent. So we are told here that one needs to be diligent to do what? Enter rest. Sounds funny, no? You're saying rest and then you're saying diligent. Work hard. Be sincere. How can we do that? Have faith. Consistent. Don't give up on your faith. Be firm. Be steadfast. Don't keep moving. Like, you know, when you see a, a, a boat in a, a storm, there's waves and winds. How does the boat look? Oh, it's shaking, shaking, shaking all over. It's not steady. But when it is anchored, what is that anchor? Faith. Even if the winds shake it a little bit, it's steadfast and firm. So faith will Keep us constant. We can be diligent. Hold on to our faith. That's what diligence means here. Hold on to your faith. To do what? To enter rest. Let anyone fall according to the example of disobedience. So he's warning them time and again. Come on, people, believers. Not the way the, the uh, previous generation you know, rebelled against God. I don't want that to happen to you. Or So now he's saying fall. You remember, it's a warning. Drift, lest you drift away, neglect. Now he says, fall. So please be careful. And now he comes to um, uh, giving the attention to God's word. Verse 12, he says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So he reveals the quality of God's word and the inherent ability. You know, uh, there is an ability which uh, a substance has. For example, we uh, could take, uh, you know, an alcohol, let's say uh, some ethyl alcohol, and you light it, it'll go up in flame. So they say the property is it's combustible or it, it can catch fire. Okay. Uh, or uh, people say uh, soap. You know, what is the property? If you put soap in water, it'll cleanse. Okay. So it has all these ingredients and it has the ability to clean in the same way. The author, he talks about the word of God and says, there is an ability which God's word has. So it is living. Don't take it lightly. If you put the word inside you, it has its ability. It's alive. You know, have you ever seen under a microscope? In school, they made us do this uh, uh, lactobacillus acidophilus. You know, you take the uh, curd a few drops and then you just put it under the microscope and you can see those creatures, those organisms and you're thinking, oh my goodness, do these creatures exist in the food that I'm eating because they're alive, they're moving around. But till you saw what was in there, you didn't realize it's living, it's active. So we are told here, God's word is like that. You put it into yourself and then um, observe who you become. There is a change. There is a transformation. And we wonder, how could it happen? Because it, the word has an ability. It is living. It is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. You know, two-edged sword, you want to cut something. There are two edges to a sword. 
it'll go deeper isn't it if you have only one edge it'll cut one side but not both sides but it is two edged meaning it can do a deep work within us piercing even the division of soul and spirit so what are the things in my soul you know what is what what is of my flesh what is of the spirit god's word has the ability ability to reveal these things to us and that is why even when we talk about the prophetic you know people say how sh- how can i know god is speaking to me is this my mind is this you know the more of the word of god we know it will help us discern what is from the flesh what is from the spirit what is the holy spirit saying okay so the word has all this ability so i'm just going to stop here because i recognize you know we are out of time uh, and i really hope we are getting something out of it and we're enjoying uh, the book of hebrews uh so at this point let's pray and close uh want to request somebody to please lead us with a word of prayer and uh, you know we can close this class okay who is able to pray anyone comfortable to unmute and pray okay aren i can't hear you okay i sorry are issue with the audio i can't hear you but thank you for offering to pray uh, how about kiran kiran can you pray so we can wrap up the class yes ma'am sir yeah please go ahead this pray father god we just come before once again your throne father god father god we want to just say thanking you father god the subject father god the to subject father god what today we learn father god about all the jesus christ and all humanity and all things father god the revelation the wisdom and the understanding father god we we want just say thanking you father god help us to move forward father god upcoming days and our life father god and your journey father god thanking you for all things thanking you father god thank you god. almighty jesus name we pray amen 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 thank you kiran thank you everyone have a blessed day you can uh, you know log off and go to your next class okay take care and i'll connect with you later thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you thank you thank you bye